Hello and welcome to another ACY Securities podcast. My name is Alastair Schultz and I'm going to be your host through today's trading journey. And today, I'm lucky enough to have Paul Rebello from Rebello FX and Inspired Mind Trading with us to have a bit of a chit chat about his trading experiences over time and how he finds working and trading from home at different intervals throughout his career. So I'd like to introduce you all to Paul. Hello, Paul. Hey, Alistair, how you going? I'm well, thank you. How have you been doing and trading in the last couple of days? Been feeling quite positive about all the COVID-19 and the changes that we're seeing with lockdowns going on? I don't know if I could say I've been feeling quite positive with the whole COVID-19 thing, but we're definitely starting to see a whole lot of volatility coming back in the market, which is a, which is a complete landscape change from uh, 2019. <laughs> oh, look, think, things have been going. Things have been going going well. It has been challenging. So, but uh, I think probably all traders out there can really say that uh, we, we we may have to adjust our trade plan because, you know, when we're aiming for our three to run ratios, it's it's more of a scalping move these days. It's just so volatile. It's a, it's quite an exciting time to be in the market. Um, I found it, uh, you know, to be. An, not just challenging, but actually really engaging to sort of get involved in. So I am looking forward to seeing what comes next for us. But we're going to start it off a little bit lighter before, <laughs> so the viewers don't, or the listeners don't get um, a little bit warned away by what's going on with coronavirus. But I mean, we'll get started with them because I mean, a lot of our listener base are, are, are new to sort of trading. So yeah. I'd like to sort of find out, I mean, What's kind of gotten you interested in trading in the beginning? Has there been a particular push for you to get involved? You know, maybe tell us a little bit about how long you've been trading as well. Yeah, look, I got, I got in a, it was it's very cliche how I got into trading. I actually got into it via a dream in my mid twenties, believe it or not. That's um, a, an interesting story. And I really want to hear <laughs> about it. So, so, so basically, you know, we go through our day-to-day -day struggles, early twenties, you know, you're, you're feeling, you're feeling the pressures, you know, particularly when you're getting mortgages, young families coming up and you know, I'm just looking at, you know, you just look at what you're doing and I don't know, I was just stressed out about money and everything like that. And I ended up having this dream one night and obviously, you know, you usually forget 99% of your dreams, but this one just felt so real. I, I saw myself in a, in a suit in the corporate world, um, all these numbers, charts, and I was making money. And then I got, then I woke up and got slapped with the real reality. Hey, that's not me. Um, but look, I let that lay dormant for a bit. And then uh, maybe a few years later, I went on a family trip uh, or family holiday over to Singapore. And um, as my wife, we were in Starbucks, and as my wife was, you know, ordering coffees, cakes, and stuff. I saw these, a group of four, four gentlemen in their flash suits and stuff. And all of a sudden this, this dream started, to, I don't know, just, just came to my head. And then I saw them uh, really, really focused and engaged in the screen or on their screens, I should say. And then all of a sudden one's given high fives. And I was like, man, so curiosity got the better of me. And I walked over then I just introduced myself and uh, I was asking, hey, what, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're trading. So trading. So it's what stocks? No, no, no. We're, we're trading forex. We just made a lot of money for our company, so we're going to get good bonuses. That's why we're loud. I went, oh wow, okay. And I just left it at that. And then, and then from that, I, I would probably have to say that that really sparked the interest because that brought like a little bit of reality to the dream that I had a few years um, prior to that. And I guess what got me inspired to start trading thereafter was I'm in, I'm in the construction industry and um, there's many, many hundreds of thousands of Australians also in the construction industry. And um, in construction, you know, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of socialising, there's a lot of sacrificing, you know, you, you being away from home, you know, a few weeks on, a few weeks off. And you can either fall into two traps. You can let your let your your brain play idle and and die. Where I, I decided, you know, bugger this. If I'm going to be working, I might as well be working towards, you know, what I saw in Singapore on, on that dream. And yeah, and then that that's where I started to begin my my study 
So, so you've uh, kind of had a, a you know, an, an inspiring event that you've just seen sort of on the side, which is, you know, in some aspects, not the most common way of sort of getting involved in trading, but in one way, it is also the same. It sort of come across your wavelength or mind length of, of, of existing in the world before you sort of gotten involved. So it's an interesting story for inspiration to sort of do it. What, what keeps you going nowadays with it? Do you, is it, do you, are you still in construction now or do you find that you are now continually just working FX inspired stuff? Well, look, you know, despite all, all, all the flash videos and the, and the scams and all these things you see of people, you know, living in luxury yachts, trading is, is, is work in progress. So yes, I'm still in construction because I mean, I'm also involved in uh, business. I've got my own business. Um, obviously you got to bring, bring put food on the table, but now trading is starting to turn from a hobby into a profession for me. So over time, I'm over time, hopefully in the very near future, I'll, I'll make that, that full transition. But yes, it, it, it is, it is all them events that, um, that led up to where I am today. And you just got to keep going. It doesn't even matter what you, you I, I'm, I'm working maybe 10, 12 hours a day, but then you got to work after work. That's your real job because that's what you want to do. Yeah. And that's the sacrifices you've got to make. So, I mean, it's really been sort of a progression. The more you've sort of spent trading, you, the more you've sort of been involved with it. And now you're sort of working on, on new things. So, what are you doing with uh, Rebello FX and, and Inspired Mind Trading? And what, what are your goals with that and how are you sort of planning on sort of helping other traders? Okay. So if, you know, in, your, in someone's trading journey, you know what I mean? I mean, we'll probably touch on that. I'm sure that your next questions will cover that. Yeah, but, sure. Um, there, there's, a, there's a whole list of hoops you could kind of, or structures, that you've got to build. Um, where Rebello FX came in, well, Rebello FX came in because, you know, I just think it's, you know, every trader should have their own little superhero name kind of thing because at the end of the day, you know, it, it's an identity. You've got, to, you've got to step yourself out of the real world um, that you're living in and you've got to create a, a, an identity because, I mean, FX is a, is a lonesome, lonesome game, you could call it. Um, and... Uh, you know, you, you, you just got to create that, that name and, and people will know you because it is a small community, well, not a small community, it's a big community, but people will remember certain names. But where the biggest part in I've found throughout my journey is probably the mindset. You know, we, there's so much education in regards to the technical analysis, the fundamental analysis, you know, I mean, and, but the two biggest draw cards in, in, into someone's success is, you know, you've got capital management, you've got the mind, the psychology. Now, capital management is pretty straightforward. I mean, that mentors and, and, and people can guide you. But on the mindset side, I felt that I was really, really lacking. You know, nat naturally, um, you know, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve most of the time, but I thought, you know, it's a business. I've got to treat it like a business. But when you're, when you're doing it by yourself and when you opened up um, our interview, you did say you're trading from home. And there's so many drawbacks when you're trading from home because, I mean, you're left to your own devices with no one to talk to. Yeah. So challenging, going through them challenges, I then decided, you know what, I'm going to start using my experience. I, I, I since then became a qualified life coach, hypnotist, and an NLP practitioner. And what I'm intending to do with that is because I'm a trader, and as many traders, I'm in the process of developing a personal coaching program that's going to be specific to traders and um, a program that's obviously going to become a, overcome a lot of the hurdles and um, you know blockages that we do have as traders because it is an emotional roller coaster. It's twenty percent skill, eighty percent attitude. When it, when it, when you really look at the nuts and the crux of it. So that's my intentions with the whole inspired mind training. Besides, also obviously being a, a a mentor to aspiring traders and and you know help developing a specialized tailored trade plan, you know checklist, a bit like what you actually did with with myself, Alistair. <laughs> Many so, years ago now. 
many years ago. But yeah, look, that, that, that's that's uh, what I'm working hard towards to now. And yeah, I'm hoping they get that uh, get the pretty much the coaching program up and running towards the uh, end of this year and, and keep rolling it out from there. Okay, so it's it's about sort of helping traders deal with with the the idea of that it can be solitary unless you're sort of working in um, trade floors and things like that, which again come with their own adversities um, yes. and and are not always going to be beneficial to each mindset that someone may have. Um, when you sort of started trading, did you have a favorite book or anything like that that you would recommend to traders to sort of read when they get started out? Well, we, we, we're trading. Uh, I've only really read one book on trading. I think you might know it. It's called uh, Essentials for Trading Students. <laughs> <laughs> you having a plug at me here, mate? <laughs> That's quite funny. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, no. In, in all honesty, that's uh, that's the only real book I read because, in my opinion, I honestly believe the best book you could read is the one you can actually write, and yeah. the, and any aspiring trader is writing their own book essentially because you're, you're going to be drawing from your experiences. Your chapters are going to be built by either if you've gone through the, the journey solo or highly recommended you engage mentors. And then, you know, you're, you're, you're taking bits of experiences and a bit, bits of um, skill sets that are tailored for you. And then you're bolting that on into your book that you're writing because I feel as if if I'm reading another person's book, unless it's an autobiography or it's something to do with, with mindset, that will probably resonate with me more. But just because someone's got a certain strategy and a certain style does not necessarily mean that it's going gonna, it's gonna to work for you. And no. trading is very, very individual. It's very customized. And that's why I, I say the best book to read is the one you write. Yeah. So, I mean, when it, when it comes to that, I mean, I know you, you've plugged away at my book there and, and my book has been about really giving as much of a broad range of understanding, but I think you're exactly right. I mean, regardless of whether I've written a book or another person has written a book, I, I've always found that education has been limited and it's really about the individual's own journey and exposing yourself to as many different styles and strategies as you possibly can so that you can sort of find what works for you. So, I mean, in, from that, I mean, how long have you really been, been trading for now? Well, Forex, I've been trading uh, since probably November 2016. So that's gone on about three and a half years now, heading yep. here, itching towards four. So, I mean, uh, relatively, look, that, that, that's still a, not a rookie in the game, but uh, over that time, I've uh, definitely, definitely um, evolved. From the, from the start. And I think for any new traders out there, in the evolving part and, and the growing part, you need to 100% get a mentor. Yeah. If you don't get a mentor, you know, you're, you're really, you're really going to have a long battling journey. So even if, even if it's just for the sociability of it all. Oh. And, um, and what about other assets? Have you sort of been trading before that as well? Yeah. So Australian securities, so obviously the, the ASX. I mean, when I refer back to, to that dream and then obviously when I saw the, the guys over in Singapore and stuff, you know, I, I started dibbling and dabbling um, in ASX and then I, I worked out clearly that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So then I had to obviously educate myself. So from that point on, I did get a diploma of share trading investment, which was purely technical analysis um diploma financial planning not because i wanted to be a financial planner because let's be honest you know if you're married financial planning goes out the window courtesy of the wife um, <laughs> and um obviously but i wanted to do that more for the for the fx side so i i needed a a solid um a solid grounding when, when, when it did come to to that very cool okay so Tell us about your current trading setup in terms of monitors, laptops. You know, what do you, what do you use for your day to day trading? Okay, I, I keep it simple. Um, given that you know I'm I'm in and out throughout the country a fair bit, 
um, particularly in the state. I, I pretty much use just my laptop. Uh, I think that's all you really need. But when I am at home, I do connect it to a to a, an additional monitor and, and I'm only connecting it to a additional monitor because I just love looking at price action on a bigger screen. So yeah. it's very simple for me. Laptop and a monitor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively similar. I have a laptop for keeping my trades while I'm on the go. Uh, but sometimes I will look at prices on my phone, but it's, I, I rarely do it and I won't place a trade through my phone. Yeah. And then at home, I keep a number of monitors. And I, over the years, I've done, you know, six or seven screens at once. And it's just sometimes a little bit too much. I think any more than three and it's starting to be overkill. Um, okay. So in, in your trading that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, where are you picking your time frames? What, what sits for you? What do you like to use? Oh, this question. This is a very, uh, very open question. But I is. would have to say... My sweet spot is probably the hourly time frame. Um, now, but I say that with a but because yes. you know um, you you got to you got to do top down analysis. So I probably my my typical my typical uh, trading day will probably start. I, I'd probably look at the uh, the daily just to get an overall bias, particularly in the direction you know where where we're moving. And yep. if something does spike my interest then I'll, I'll look at the four hourly and i'm only predominantly looking at the four hourly just to see if there's any um good pattern setups you know double bottoms triple tops whatever it may be and then i'll use the hourly to execute my trades but i'll also use the 30 minute to see if i can get a tighter stop loss in so i can uh, increase so you my, sort of, you uh, sort of flick back and forth a bit have you found that with you know, the world events that we're seeing now that your time frames have changed? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, in saying that, uh, I, I've actually, um, I've actually joined a uh, Forex family, so to speak, uh, a guy called um, Raja. And the reason why I've gone there, because I, I, you know, in times like this, you can't be rigid. Um, so I, th these guys are pretty much scalpers. Not that I'm, not that I'm a. I can traditionally say that I'm a scalper. However, their their level of understanding and price action is pretty impressive. And I'm I'm thinking that I'm. They use they predominantly use a 30 minute time frame, and and also monitor their their uh, their risk management through a 15 minute chart. So I'm I'm actually now starting to add that to my trade plan and and firstly observe and then try and uh, see if I can build a strategy um, around it because the traditional three, three to one measure, whatever risk, uh, risk ratio that uh, risk to reward ratio that someone aiming, it, it's thrown out the window right now. There are so many whipsaws. There's, there's flash crashes. It's just all over the place. And, and I'm thinking this is really a scalpers market at the minute. Okay, so you, are you a little bit more discretionary in, in what you do with your trading because of that sort of, or what you're finding in, in, in the market as well? Yeah, pure discretion. Um, I love being accountable for my own, own decision making. You know, when you, when, you put, when you put your work into the analysis, so for anyone that thinks uh, trading is just a gamble, particularly young traders, man, you've got to put in your work. You know, you... If, if you're looking at the economic calendar, obviously to get the fundamental drives and then you're lining up your, your technical um, setups, absolutely. I, I, I reckon the mechanical style trader, and I'm not going to comment too much because I've never had experience with the mechanical side, but I really think that they would be, well, they would have to adjust their algorithms because um, it's, it's definitely, you need to have your finger on the pulse. The, the, the markets are changing we've got to change and, and really price action is king. Um, I even think uh, indicators, even though they're already lagging, that they'll be really lagging now just, just in the pure volatility. So yeah, yeah, discretion all day. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I've, I've you know, transitioned all the way through on mine. So, so tell me a little bit about your own sort of journey, I suppose, through trading. Did you sort of 
start out as mechanical or technical and, and then and migrate your way through or have, has it been the opposite or what have, what have you found? Um, well, when I did the diploma in share trading investment, which is basically pure technicals, but that's for Australian securities, right? I, I was very, I, I love charts. So when you, when you look at it, I'm very, very much technical. But then um, when uh, we got connected and, uh, and I happily took you as uh, my mentor, um, you really, you really uh, challenged me um, in regards to that, you know, my game was not so complete, particularly on the, on the fundamental side. So now we're combining the fundamentals and the technicals um, on a day-to-day -day basis, which is gold, because usually you've got predominantly one or the other. In regards yeah. to the mechanical setups, or I just I, I think when you're learning the art of trading, because it is technically like a science, you need you need to have understand how to do things manually before you can naturally progress into something that's you know you probably don't have total control or total accountability for because it's, it's a bit, easy it's, to blame something it's a bit like almost you know the the f1 car racer you wouldn't take him straight from the go-kart and then dump him straight into an f1 car yeah correct it's because correct. all all the buttons and things that go into it you sort of sit in the dashboard and go oh wow what am i looking at here um so i think in that sort of regard you know you're exactly right uh if, if you had to start again and go right back to the beginning what sort of advice would you give yourself, you know, when you had that dream, you know, that very first dream you ever had about trading, what sort of advice would you give yourself to pursue or knowing what you know now? Um, the establishment of a trade plan and, and the adherence of a trade plan. I, I, I probably would, I probably definitely would have demo traded first and I actually went against your advice yeah, particularly when I rolled into FX, which, you know, you, you did kick my ass a fair few times before. <laughs> no, no, just for the listeners out there, not, not literally, not literally. <laughs> yeah, um, but definitely demo trading. And the reason why I say this is because what is a trade plan? A trade plan is a buildup of your capital management plan, a mindset checklist, which definitely needs to be bolted on into there. It's your, your execution checklist, which is obviously, you know, what time frame, how you're entering, how you're exiting, what are your strategies? And, um, you know, you've got to put that, you've got to compile that together and then you've got to test it. You, you've actually got to test this thing on a demo account and, and test it for maybe 20 or 30 trades. And if you've tested that for 20 or 30 trades, you, you can gauge it by performance. Um, and then the other thing that I wish I kind of knew, which I reckon would have potentially could have halved my learning curve, yeah, I would say as much as half, is what type of trader do you want to be? Or what type of trader do I want to be? Do I want to be a retail trader or do I want to be a professional trader? There's two, diff com two complete different mindsets. A retail trader, you know, you're just going to always treat that as a hobby. You're at home. Your risk management's out the window. You're trying, to, you're trying to live the dream of what these guys on the internet are trying to portray, the Ferraris, and it's not a reality. But then you've got a professional trader where if someone wants to be a professional trader and, and train for a propriety firm, hey, you, 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 there's a lot of money that can come to you, but you've got to adhere to strict rules. Just hear those strict rules. So, for example, you know, you've got companies out there that, okay, we'll fund you, uh, 100,000, you need to attain a 12% target with a 4% with a, um, drawdown, maximum 4% drawdown. You ask most traders out there what a drawdown is, they'll look at you blankly. You ask a lot of traders out there, what's a stop loss? What's that? Then you, you straight away you know. I mean, people can say they're making 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 percent. But at the end of the day, what's their risk? And, and ultimately, a trader will always be measured on his risk management. So that is probably the other thing besides the trade plan is determine, do you want to be a professional, which is the path I've gone down, or do you want to be a retailer? Two different worlds, two different mindsets.
I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, I, I think you are very passionate about that. I mean, are you going to be using that with your inspired mind trading? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because you can't, if someone wants to come, come to me, or what, what, actually, let's, let's rewind the clock back to you, Alistair. The first thing you said to me, or one of the first things you said to me is, what do you know about training? I say, yeah, you know, I know what a double bottom, a tick, bit of technical. And what do you know about Forex? Uh, well, that's what I'm hoping you can help me with. You turn around to me and you said, listen, go to babypits.com, do the school of pipology, and then come back to me. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> but you know what? That, 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 that's... That's what you. That's what you need to do, and I am passionate about it because when when if if I've got a trader, I've got one student now who is actually also my happens to be my godson, but the the kid, well, I wouldn't call him a kid. His young man is switched on, so he he's gone through them hurdles, the, the hoops that I'm trying to make him go through to understand the game that he's going to get into, because there's no point teaching someone something if you're going to have to take him back down to the grassroots. If someone needs to have a certain level of understanding, so then you can start moving into the important stuff, the trade plan, the psychology, how you want to structure it, how we're going to get our performance. And, and, and they're the only people that I want to deal with. Anyone can say, I want to, I want to trade, but how many, how many people quit? There's like a non, is it, what is it? 95%? Oh, I, mean, quit. I think the uh, actual estimates are, 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 yeah, probably much higher than 95%. Uh, but I mean, if you look at, like, I mean, this is a part of my own beliefs as well. When you look at the idea of uh, trading and normal business, you know, most businesses or 95% of businesses tend to fail in their first year and most aren't profitable in their first two or three years. There you go. And so on those sort of statistics, you know, you could look at most traders who, who would be in that same sort of category. Um, I certainly wasn't profitable in my first year. I don't think I was. I mean, I started quite young, uh, but I don't, you know, it's not really been profit all the way until I had had, you know, been exposed to a lot of different things and formulated my, my own ideas around what might be the best way to do things. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, those failure rates, whilst they do exist, I think it really does become down to that mentality of, are you here to be doing this as a hobby because you think you can make extra cash out of it in a very quick period of time? Or are you here to treat this as a business? And those two mindsets really dictate whether or not I think traders are going to be successful. I think the other aspect that I've you know seen them not always sort of kind of seen is that most guys that have... Uh, usually gone on to be quite successful have had some level of a loss and literally been brought to the brink of are they going to quit or are they going to keep going uh, and in almost all instances those ones that do end up rising from the ashes tend to be the guys who have been nearly broken by trading and decided I'm not going to let it beat me I've got two I've got two things sad there with exactly what you, you, you just said so to put it in perspective for um, new traders that want to that wanna step into the game. So Alice, if I ask you, what, what, are, what, are my, what is the average general market returns uh, investor can see year in, year out? What percentage are we looking at? Um, so sorry, just repeat that for me. So, the, so let's just say if we, we've pumped, you know, $100,000 into a... Um, into a stock commodity or whatever, what are we looking at? About 10, 15% return per annum on average? Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, you know, I would go off the leading index. So if it was yeah. S and P 500, you know, you'd be looking at somewhere between if you had just invested only in S and P 500, you'd be making between 12 and sort of 16% per annum on average. Oh. Okay. So let's put that into perspective. So if you think that, uh, or if, if a trader thinks that they're going to go in there and, and rule the world, and let's just say you start off with a hundred thousand dollar account, right? And you had a, a proper risk management setup, i.e., you know what I mean? You you don't want to you don't want to blow anything over four percent. And let's just say you made you know your 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 fifteen percent. You think that fifteen percent is someone's going to live off that, like? 
No, because that, that, that works that out is, to be fifteen thousand dollars a year. Like exactly. So who, who who's gonna who's gonna live of fifteen percent or fifteen thousand dollars? So that that's why it makes a lot more sense that if someone wants to to take this seriously, to to aim to be a proprietor for, because you've got. I mean, you you actually introduced me to this this world as well. You've got people that will throw hundreds of thousands of dollars to you to manage, providing that you you are set up and doing the right things. And the other point that you made as well is, you know, people that would just quit. You know, there was a stage um, in in my career, I could say, it, probably about two. It was probably just after two years. Um, I had a trade. Uh, I think it was New Zealand, New Zealand GDP. I was I was long, so I was with the I was with the Bulls. But anyway, it decided to take a, a turn for for the worse. And because I was so used to winning, um, I kept moving my stop loss, moving my stop loss. Eventually, to a point that, hey, I blew my account, and uh, I was so embarrassed. I was so. I, I, I just couldn't believe because I, I was so used to winning, but I took that loss. I felt like quitting. And then out of whether it was something in the air, you actually rang me the next day. Don't ask me how, don't ask me why you did. And then you said, Oh, how's your training going? Um, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> I think I remember this conversation. <laughs> yes, you do. And then you said, look, you're a talented trader. You know, you're, you're, you, you know, you, you did tell me my, my results were, were amazing and I just got to keep going. This is, these are the things that are happening. And it was probably then and then that I realized, hey, you, you're not bigger than the game. You, you've got to adapt and you've got to respect the markets. And, 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 and it's, that's, why, that's another reason why you need a mentor in your trading journey. Because hadn't you given me that call? I mean, for most people that know me, I'm not a... I'm not a quitter, but I very felt like quitting because it was a big kick in the guts. But mm. thanks for that. That's all right. Anytime. You just let me know when you're going to have one of those episodes. I'll give you a call. <laughs> we'll, put it, we'll put it on a podcast, eh? Um, so, I mean, like, you know, it is, it is right. I mean, training does come with a large degree of mentality to it. There's a huge amount of education that's required. Um, you know, have, when, when it's gone through all of this, I mean, you've, how, how have you found, you know, having, keeping trading journals and, and things like that? I mean, I, I spoke to someone uh, not long ago uh, who, who said that they found that you keeping a trading journal wasn't all that cracked up for them because it just didn't work for them. And this is where it comes into that individuality side of things. So do you keep a trading journal yourself? Yes, I do. Absolutely. I, I, I probably have two parts to it. I, I have the initial analysis that I'm, that I'm doing. So obviously my working is towards my decision and why I'm, I'm taking that trade. So that's, we'll call it the part A. And then the part B is I'll revisit and, and I'll analyze after the trade has been closed out, whether it's in profit or it's loss, just mm -hmm. so I can then say, okay, did, were my rules effective for that particular time? Did I break them and make amendments as necessary? So absolutely it's important for okay. my, opinion, so, that's my so, opinion. I mean, your, your journal sort of, journaling for trading has really come from keeping yourself in check correct okay and do you use it as well for sort of that you know uh the mindfulness side of things as well yes yes i i part one of the checklists that uh i've created uh, you know i actually make a checklist what how am i feeling am i feeling lousy am i am i feeling motivated am i feeling in the zone you know have i been i even put have you even been drinking because you know a lot of people will come come out there and you know they'll have a few drinks and think they can uh, dominate the market so the, the the mindset is is important are you tired because when you're tired you're not you're not making the best decisions so yeah absolutely that's part of my job okay and have like i mean in doing so i mean what what do you look for in your journal do you go through it sort of each day and review it do you sort of consider uh, what might be impacting your trading and sort of and, and when do you sort of turn around and go you know, okay, well, I'm not going to be trading for a day or two because I need to sort of give it a rest for a minute. Um, I probably, I probably review all my trades. I'll, I'll, I'll brief it the, the next day that I'm, when I'm, when I jump on the markets, which is pretty much the, the New York session. But on Sunday, uh, Sunday evening, 
I'll probably review all my trades and and what I'll do, I'll, I'll particularly look at my entries and my exits where my where my stop loss was initially placed, and then and actually and obviously where my take profits are. See how the run has moved, because if you look at a if you look at the charts enough, particularly certain pairs, they're quite repetitive in in the fact that they you know they they're displaying certain behaviours, yep. and then you know any fine tweak that that you're able to find on that particular pair, then you know you, you're able to adjust. In particular, when when you're going to be uh, trading that that pair moving forward, so yeah, I critique, and then I'll make notes, and then when I'm on that pair, I'll, I'll draw I'll draw my notes and um, act accordingly. Mm. Have you ever found yourself being overly critical of yourself because of journaling? <clears throat> Paralysis and analysis, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it, it, it does. It does happen, but at, at the end of the day, that's what your trade plan is. You've got to trust the process, and, yeah. and, that, and that's where you've got to re- eliminate that emotion. Yeah. So it's very much that almost a technical yeah. mentality towards the rule set that you sort of have. Correct. Um, okay. So I mean, do you have? I mean, I'm, the next question I kind of you know, as, as some of them might know, we've, we've got a sort of a, a prefab list of questions here that we're, we're trying to get through with, and using, but the next one seems like a bit of a moot point because it's, do you have any mentors and who are they? All right. Well, there's yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think, um, I mean, look, yes, you, you initially got me uh, trading Forex, um, you know, I, I've worked towards now to becoming you know, a professional. Yep. Um, but I, I also, will, I mean, we've kept in touch even after the, these years. And I'll always use you as a point of contact in regards to, you know, if, I'm, if I've got any um, uh, technical questions. Yep. You know, it, it, am I looking at something that you may be looking at differently? Whether it's anything to do with a trade plan, with a journal, you, you, need, you need that person. Like, yep. and, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I can say that, you know, obviously there's yourself. Yep. Then there's, I have a guy, well, he probably doesn't even know this, but there's, um, his name's uh, Brad Gilbert. He's yep. from Traders for Traders. Yep. Um, I look at uh, Brad as a, as a mentor. I'm actually working towards getting a funded account with him as we speak. Which yep. Which is good. But I really draw on his experience uh, fundamentally. Um, he's very... Well, that not just Brad. The, the whole team's very in tune with the um, the economic calendar and what the central banks are thinking, and that is that is a critical part. So that that's my my fundamental side. And now, as I mentioned earlier on the podcast, that um, I'm now going to start exploring and, and start um, kind of like monitoring the uh, forex family with Raja because I, I do believe that they're, they're amazing scalpers um, and, and their timing, everything. I mean, they, they really, they are really highly skilled. And so I, I'm also going to start looking at only because what's traditionally worked before is kind of um, we're in uncharted waters. And when you're in uncharted waters, you need to, you need to um, change your sail so you can kind of get some clarity and direction. And I, I'm thinking that this is really a scalpers mark. So I, I, then he's a new new mentor of mine. I, I could say probably doesn't even know that yet as well. But I'll, <laughs> I'll be definitely um, watching that. So I've got my bases covered. And what about on the celebrity front? Do you have any traders that you sort of follow or you keep an eye on what they're doing? Like maybe it's Ray Dalio or Warren Buffett or anything along those sort of lines? Nah, nah, yeah? uh, nah. I, I no. I, I I think maybe when when uh, when you get to a certain level because I, me personally, I, I feel as if I get, um, you know, you kind of like get influenced and w- by them and, you know, you, you see, you know, their successes and automatically you think you could probably adapt to them. I try to step away from that and try to develop my own strategy using my mentors. Yep. And then when I'm comfortable and confident, then I'll have an appreciation because I've got something that I know is working as well. Yeah. Yeah, understood. That's um, pretty straightforward for that one. 
Um, and like, I mean, are you, you're trading FX now. Do you still dabble in stocks or, or anything, any other asset classes that you haven't uh, usually contended with? Yeah, well, look, it's, it's all not, it's about 95% FX for me, but the other 5%, I, I just use um, uh, stocks now as a, as an investment vehicle. Yep. I had, um, and, and I, and I kind of confirmed it like stocks. I worked briefly in uh, for a stock broking house beginning of last year. Um, and I quickly learned that it's a lot, it's the long-term game. You know what I mean? Like in stocks, you, you're investing, you're investing, you know, you're creating your wealth for the future, irrespective of what type of market it is. You know, you're locking in a, a dividend, a high dividend when, you know, the growth is low, blah, blah, blah. But, I, 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 stocks to me is just purely an investment vehicle. FX is is where the action is. I mean, it's it's the it's the mother of the uh, the ASX. Yeah, or, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I, I I mean, I mean, I think I find myself to be uh, a little bit different in that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I deal with. I, I don't think there's an asset class that I would reject, other than maybe, dare I say it, cryptocurrency. Um, <laughs> oh, crypto! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the biggest fan of crypto. I'm sure some people will have already heard my um, qualms on it because it's just one of those markets that there's. You know, I, I don't when I don't see an underlying reason for an asset, uh, I, I struggle to, to really sort of gauge what its value is. But, exactly. But I could do another whole podcast on, on that to be, to be totally honest. But um, what, in your day-to-day -day setup and your trading, what, what are some rules that you kind of live by to get, get underway with your trading? Uh, I do a little bit of mindfulness um, before I get into certain exercises that I did just get myself um, in the zone of the markets. Then I'll touch. Or I'll have a brief view of my trade plan, but the, again, the, the trade plan is only my my guidelines of what I should be doing that I've developed. And then I heavily rely on my checklists, um, my little tick and flicks, um, before I make any executions of, of the trades. And then again, like I said, I'll, I'll probably do that over over across 40, 40 trades, and then I'll revisit and just repetitive 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 so they're, okay. they're the kind of rules that i live by okay so it's much more consistency is king rule for you correct okay and how do you like i mean when it comes to sort of your checklist i mean how do you know when you're in the right or the wrong position is there something that will make make you close the position early or do you kind of set and forget and just let it ride out well, besides the stop loss being hit, which we don't want, <laughs> if we're in a, if we're in the wrong position, or the let's just say the the take profit being hit. Um, look, if 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 I've set a trade, if I've put a trade, and let's just say I've gone long GPJPY. Yeah. Okay. Um, all of a sudden, the trajectory comes into a consolidation. In a consolidation, then then the then price action decides to to break out in the opposite direction i probably would have the tendency and this is where discipline comes in is probably to to um close out my my trade because i know that obviously she's going to be taking a, a a turn for the worse so i think that's pretty much how i would manage um a position particularly in the, in in the that's going in the wrong direction or, and or my stop loss has been hit. And I try to keep my stop losses uh, pretty tight as well. Okay. And like, I mean, does that, does that, when it comes to sort of the sort of winning and the losing side, how mm -hmm. do you sort of handle the mindfulness of it when you've had a losing streak or a winning streak? Is there something that you do to sort of try and keep that feeling as business as possible? I have a really good punching bag. No, it's not. It's, uh, I have the punching bag, but what I do on a losing streak, I um, what I then do is I know, okay, so I'm, I've gone into a funk. Something's not working. So every position forward, I'll then reduce 
my uh, capital or the risk that, that I'm going to be doing into my account. So if I, let's just say I'm using half a percent, I'll go down to 0.25% um, for, the, for the trades that are proceeding. Okay. Um, and, and if I'm winning, it's the same on, on the winning side, you know, then if, some, if something's working, it could be a particular pair that, you know, that, I, that I'm trading and, and I'm understanding, you know, how, how it's moving. You know, it's in correlation with the sentiment. It's, in correl it's supported by the central banks and obviously economic calendar. I'll then probably look at increasing my positions. Um, not increasing my position initially. If I've taken a profit, I'll incorporate that profit into my risk and I'll probably split it into uh into two trades uh, one with maybe about 80 percent of my position the other one with 20 percent of the position and i'll have a runner um I'll, I'll secure profits and then i'll let a runner run and then trail my stop loss uh whatever direction i'm going okay i mean that seems like a fairly reasonable way to sort of keep a handle on on what's going on with with trading um, and how you sort of react to, you know, a negative or a positive run of, of positions. Uh, and and what, what are you sort of thinking long term now? Uh, and how do you see the market sort of responding with the dilemmas we're seeing around COVID-19? And, of course, the lockdowns. I, mean, I know you're in Western Australia and you guys have had borders closed as well from interstate. So very similar to what I'm experiencing here in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 are you, what are your anticipations over the next sort of, I mean, I know neither of us are doctors, uh, but as, you know, analysts and, and being able to look at charts and sort of put and frame that mindset of what's happening in the world, do you think it is inherently different to what we saw in 2008 versus now? Yes, because at least... Leading up to 2008, or you know, the later part of 2007, it was kind of like, it was kind of like, in 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 steps. It was staged, and we've we've pretty much gone into a recession, whether people want to call it or not, in a flick of the switch. You know what I mean? That that that's why I I think everything's just gone crazy. And then I, if I can recall a few conversations ago, oh, over a couple of years, you know, you you were you're always mentioning about our property market in Australia. That's uh, that that bubble was going to birth. I think now, you know what you were mentioning, and and I, and I tend to agree. I think the property market in Australia, particularly in Western Australia, is gonna is gonna bust. All these stimulus packages and everything that the government's you know now trying to uh, provide. Who's going to be paying that back? Um, industries, I mean, you just take, it, it's chaos. It, it, it is absolute mayhem. And I don't think any of us have seen, all I do know from a trader side, the markets are going to start to be volatile and anyone trying to come into the, as traders now coming into the market, it's going to be, a, it's going to be quite challenging because you're going to be seeing unnatural moves. But yeah, it, it is scary, but it is also exciting because we just don't know what's going to happen, Death. I just, I just hope um, they can find a cure for this, for this beast and um, we can resume normality. But do you think there's really uh, a normality to trading? I mean, I know personally from trading before the GFC and trading after, and might add during the GFC, that markets never went back to the way they were. Uh, mm. And in this instance, you know, I, I find it to be inherently similar in that nature. The rest of it is absolutely right. You know, it, it is completely, completely different sort of scenario. You know, well, like the previous one was based on a financial crisis. This has been a health crisis, which has turned into a financial crisis of which we haven't really seen the full realized losses yet. Or what do you think we'll hit? The, do you think we'll hit the depression status? Um, it, to, to a certain degree, uh, I think it is very possible. Um, I mean, if you look at the US uh, employment figures, you know, they've had 10 million people uh, apply for employment benefits because they've lost their jobs in the past fortnight alone. Yeah, exactly. That's, it's, that's, 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 that's monstrous. Like, I, you know, I, I've, you know, I'm a little bit younger uh, than 
some traders out there and I've never sort of seen uh, that aspect in the market before. You know, even in 2008, we didn't have 10 million people file for unemployment in the first two weeks. And I might add that when it came to our most recent NFP results, that hasn't been realized. You know, yes. we, haven't, we haven't seen the, because, you know, they, when it comes to NFP and it comes to those employment figures, you know, they tally it all to the middle of the month. So about, you know, I believe March 14 was the cutoff date for that. And then the following two weeks presiding was us seeing this, you know, the first week was 3.28 million. And the second week was, was 6.6. So NFP just didn't even count for that. Um, and you know, the, the expectation was, you know, Oh, we're going to have a hundred thousand less jobs. And it was like, what? <laughs> how, do you, how do you forecast that? I've we just had 10 million people go without work. Yes. And apply I, for- I think it's damage. It's just damage control. Um, that, that's all they're trying to do because like, like you just said, it's, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, I mean, I, I anticipate that, you know, there is a very strong possibility of a depression um, especially here in Australia. I mean, you know, when you think of, you know, gravity, you know, the more something goes up, the harder it kind of hits the ground uh, after a certain point. But, you know, is, is that going to be the case here and now, especially considering Australia has spent 29 years in a growth range? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard to gauge. I think the hardest effect places are really going to be, you know, the major hubs of, of, of Australia. And, but, you know, on the other side of that, will manufacturing return to, you know, this country? Who knows? It would be good. It would be good. I mean, I think one of the key elements that if you look back to when the Australian, like, I mean, if you look back as to why we moved our manufacturing offshore was because the strength of the Australian dollar had risen so much and it then became cheaper to purchase offshore products and to manufacture it locally. So Mm. does that change the perspective now with a weaker Australian dollar? Does that mean that, you know, manufacturing has the opportunity to grow and build here locally? I think that that's something that uh, definitely needs to be put into place. I mean, we, we, we have to create, we have to create jobs because I mean, technology is taking a lot of the jobs. I mean, and that's, that goes for every single industry. So, there needs there needs to be a radical change for radical times. Um, how, how do you what do you still take your same outlook in regards to the property market? I never forget these uh, discussions. What do you think's happening with the property? Um, yes, <laughs> short answer. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I you know I mean it doesn't take a genius to work out that when you've got a property market that is dangerously overpriced in comparison to what Australia's wage growth has been uh, in the same period of time. Like we've had, you know, consistent growth some years, uh, you know, running in a row of like 15% in property prices. Correct. What, what, what sounds good about that idea? Oh yeah. Our prior, our houses are getting more expensive. Like, no, that's not, that's not a good thing necessarily. You know, the, me- the medium cost of living in a large amount of places is, is being disadvantaged by the fact that you can't afford to live there. So, you know, yes, that may be the case. And most people would sort of suggest, oh, well, you can't live, if you can't afford to live there, then don't live there. Well, that's all very well. But where do we have, you know, the highest proportionate amount of jobs in this country it happens to be where the highest proportionate prices for housing are. That's right. And if you're not seeing wage growth, if you're not seeing people's, you know, um, ability to purchase things grow, you know, I mean, even, even looking at what people are doing with how leveraged they are in property as an asset class on its own. You know, you've got, I remember not that long ago, maybe, maybe a year ago, uh, that if the interest rate was to go up by 0.40%, so not even two basis point rises, it's like 1.5. If it went up that far, then 50% of mortgages in Australia would not be able to make their next repayment. That's correct. And, and, and that is the alarming, that's the alarm bells that, that is, to, and, it, and it just had to, uh, health crisis, you know, is obviously now spiked. So, so I, I mean, it, yeah. in, in this instance now, like it's had the, it's the opposite effect. We've had the interest rate go down and, you know, at first you sort of go, Oh, well, that means housing prices are going to go up. 
again because statistically like if you actually put interest rates and what housing prices are side by side in growth then they work against each other basically the further one goes down the other one goes up it's an inverse relationship but if you then take into account okay well yeah okay maybe maybe they put housing prices down i mean uh at the interest rate down and we might see housing prices rise but i think it'll be a short-term event i think we'll start seeing the value of property drop dramatically when people realize they don't have jobs anymore and they can't afford to keep things now the only thing that's going to sort of save that i mean i know there's a lot of talk right now about government covering commercial rents to sort of keep things in place so that the landlords don't get boned if you will on mm. on that sort of thing but in every other recession we've ever had in the world there's never been a bailout like that correct that's exactly so, so, why, so, so why why artificially inflate housing prices further by helping people who are who are in a position of holding property as an investment that doesn't really add up to me because that just means you're stuffing it up again you know you're building a bubble upon a bubble upon a bubble upon a bubble and after all of this is over if you've paid that rent or that recession money to you know help people keep their their investment properties then what happens like if i bought a stock tomorrow and it bombed out i can't get the money back absolutely not that's right if you've made an investment in a property like <laughs> stiff dickies man <laughs> controversial i know considering the current controversial i know considering the current state of affairs but I mean, that's, that's, that's the game. If you're investing in things, then you are taking risk. Regardless of whether you're in a situation where we have an economic crisis or a health crisis that results in one, you have still taken a risk and you cannot predict what's going to happen exactly. So that's the way you sort of have to deal with it. And for this idea of, you know, government subsidised rents and and, and helping those landlords maintain their mortgages and all that sort of thing that's sort of been traversing around, you know, social media just seems, you know, absolutely ludicrous to me. In, in previous recessions, if you couldn't afford the repayments, you sold that asset. That's right. Sometimes at a loss. I think this day and age, it's a lot of the times at a loss. We, 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 like you said, we've got no wage growth. Everything still keeps going up. And uh, it, it's, it's, got, it's hit boiling point now. It's absolute boiling point. I mean, even the correlation between gold and silver. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if you've been following gold, but you've seen gold just blowing past silver. Now when, you know, traditionally, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of on par. But our problems also, uh, you know, reflected in Canada. In England, you know, they're, they're all going through this to the same thing. So, yeah, well, it's, it's definitely scary times. Well, I mean, in, in talking about gold and silver, I mean, gold and silver is a 5,000-year-old asset. Yes. Literally. And I think there's only been three times in history, in the, in the total 5,000-year history, that gold and silver per ounce have gone past the 100 to 1 ratio. So, oh, wow. In, in that instance, know that. you know, the idea that it takes 100 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. And right now, it's like 124 to one. Yeah, it is when, crazy. I'm when, a... when for 5,000 years, it's been 16 to one consistently. Now, in the space of 20 years, we've seen it hit that three times, which says that modern economics and the modern economies of scale are doing mm. something about like this bubble situation that keeps being built upon and the idea of globalization is causing some some interesting changes to the world yeah i mean i i have even stopped trading gold now have you seen the spreads the spreads are just <laughs> wild it's it's exciting <laughs> and, and 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 that's the thing you know so any new trader that's going to be coming you know that things are going to start trading now i mean these are extra, extraordinary times. So, you know, that's where patience and discipline and actually getting it right off the right foot and people that have been doing it for a while, you know, pe people, are, people are cashing in and, and, and it's, and rightfully so. 
that's why I've got to keep working, uh, keep working on the getting on the grind and working on the game and take advantage of, you know, the years, uh, the experience that, that that has been drawn, and yeah. Uh, so that's the way it's, it's got to be moving forward. Oh, it's going to be good times moving ahead, I'm sure. But it's going to be a long slog until we get past the next sort of hurdles that the whole world is facing right about now. Well, I would love very much to uh, thank you for attending today and giving me the opportunity to sort of pick your brain a bit on what your thoughts and opinions are on trading and working from home and, and the whole nine yards. So thank you for attending today, Paul. Um, Thank you. And uh, I look forward to getting you back on the show at another time in the future. Absolute pleasure, Alistair.